want to comment on something before I really get in because uh, Brother Sammy, you brought it up to me just a while ago. Uh, Brother Sammy, he he is frequent for him looking at me and saying, you know, smile, man, smile. <laughs> As I see you walking around, you know, you just, you just don't smile. <laughs> Earlier, he, he said, you know, we're, we're here to celebrate. It's not a funeral. Smile. <laughs> and that's true. But I want to say, if you see me that way, before I come up here, I cannot express to you the nervousness and the weight that I feel on me. The most awe thing I've ever done is to stand up here behind a wooden podium and to try and tell people what God's word says. Yes, I don't smile a lot when I come up here. It's because as I study and prepare, it is as if I'm wrestling with the Lord and he grabs a hold of me and does not let me go until I walk off these steps. And until that point, I feel a weight that I cannot explain to you. I just, I hope you understand that. I don't mean to be mean. I don't mean to look mean. It is something I can't explain. This morning, especially, I've felt a great burden to preach to you from a very popular passage of scripture. It is one of my favorite, but I must confess I can honestly hope to explain to you about 10% of all that it contains because its truths are so deep. Its truths are so higher and wider than anything I can comprehend. Maybe you can comprehend more. I pray that you can, but I cannot. All I hope to do this morning is to praise our glorious Lord Jesus Christ and to hope that you will understand something a little more about Christ. That's all I hope. I want to this morning begin with saying that I think most of us here would say that we came to this place because of Jesus Christ. We came here today to sing songs and go to classes to listen to a message preached because of who Jesus Christ is. At least I hope you said that. But I believe most of us would say it is because of Jesus Christ that we are sitting here today. I believe most of you would say that if Jesus Christ is important to you, obviously the gospel of Jesus Christ is very important to you. You would say that he is your savior, that you have been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that the gospel of God is one of the most important parts of your life. This morning, I want to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to show you what I believe is the most detailed description and account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most detailed account the Bible anywhere gives about the gospel. Why? Because this account that I want to preach to you from, it's detailed, it's graphic in explaining the gospel. And it should make clear what you may have not understood before about the gospel or about salvation. And it answers what I also believe is one of the greatest problems ever found in the Bible. And before I actually have a stand and get to the passage, I, I want to start and share this with you to help you see how this passage I'll preach from explains a great problem. And here's the great problem. It's found in Exodus 34, verse 6. It is when Moses asked God if he could see his glory. And God told him, I'll put you in the cleft of this mountain, but you can't see my face because no man can see my face and live. This event happened here. It says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as he called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Let me repeat this. It said in verse 7 that God says of himself, I forgive, show loving kindness for thousands, forgive sins and transgressions and iniquity, yet 
God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the sins of the fathers on the children and the grandchildren and to the third and fourth generations. The problem is that God says in one sentence, I am a loving, good, and forgiving God, yet I leave no sinner unpunished. I heard a pastor who has been an influence on me say one time, he went to a conference of teenagers, and he said, I have something to tell you, something about God. And he said, God, uh, actually he said, I have bad news to tell you. And he said, the bad news is God is good. And everybody looked at him. What do you mean that's bad news? God is good. He said, the bad news is God is good, and you are not. And what does a good God do with a sinner like me and you? Because he says to Moses, on the one hand, I leave no sinner unpunished, yet I show forgiveness to many. That is a great problem in all of the Bible. How can God do both? And the passage I want to preach to you from really answers this question, that God is good and you and I are not, so what does a good God do with us? How can he forgive a sinful person like me? This passage here has been many commentaries written on it, many sermons given from it. I found one pastor who, in this one chapter alone, where I'll be from, preached 70-some-odd sermons. It's very deep. All I can do is give you an overview. You may be thinking we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about Jesus Christ. We're in the New Testament. Actually, this passage is from the Old Testament this morning. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And I hope that God will bless your heart as I try to explain this chapter to you. As you're turning there, let me set the setting for you. Isaiah prophesied for almost 60 years. He's considered one of the most great prophets in all of the Old Testament that God ever used. He prophesied under the reign of four different kings. He saw the Assyrians capture the northern kingdoms of Israel. He mostly prophesied to the southern kingdoms of Judah because at that time there was a civil war and Israel had split between north and south. He was mostly with Judah in the south. So they were not in captivity, but yet they were turning to idols and they were rebelling and they were not turning to God. So he prophesied that God said one day another empire, the Babylonian empire, will come and take all of you into captivity. And as he's prophesying these things of dread and destruction... God comforts Israel by prophesying to them that they would be saved, though, one day, that God would deliver them from all captivity, that he would recall them back to the promised land. He would make them a people once again. In the middle of the book where I'm at, God also tells Isaiah to prophesy to them that not only would he one day physically save Israel, he will one day spiritually save Israel from all their sin. And that there would be one who would come, who would deliver them from the captivity of sin, who would free them from the bondage of sin. And that he would do this not just for Israel, but the rest of the world. So that's this portion here in the book of Isaiah about God's servant, it's called. Before I read to you Isaiah 53, or go through it, I need to help you understand how we need to interpret this chapter, and then I'll get to my sermon. You cannot understand Isaiah chapter 53 unless you understand what I'm about to say right here. As I go through this, there will seem to be two or three different people talking at various times, and you will be asking, well, who's talking here? Who's saying this? I'll try to explain it to you, but the best way to understand this whole chapter, it looks forward into the future of this, when Christ comes again to reign on his throne. It looks forward to that period, and it is Israel. Israel, who has been redeemed by Christ, they're looking back and saying Psalm 53. Psalm 53, the speakers, is a redeemed Israel, looking back and weeping over how wicked they were throughout all of history before God. I'll try to make that clear as we go, but understand that going into it. It's also Zechariah 12 to help you see this. God said in Zechariah, I will pour out on the house of David, on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem or Israel, the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep 
bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. God prophesied through another prophet, one day I will send my Holy Spirit on all Israel and they will look back and weep at how they treated my Savior. Isaiah 53 is that mourning, that weeping, I'm trying to say. So understand that going into it. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. I want to begin reading in chapter 52, verse 13, and only read through 15. Isaiah 52, 13 says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations, kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for the privilege to stand before these good people who have taken of their time to come to your house today. Thank you for the privilege you have given my, my life to be able to stand and to say to people that this is what God has said from his word. And Father, I'm so unworthy to say anything from your Bible. God, you know how sinful of a man I can be. And God, I beg you to give me grace behind this pulpit as I do every time. That you would give me feet to stand on to be able to say something that would pierce to the hearts of people, Lord. Holy Spirit, I beg you that if there are lost here, you would speak to their hearts so clearly about the truthfulness of Jesus Christ. I pray for Christians, Lord, here, that you would encourage them, you would strengthen them to understand more about the gospel of their Savior. In your Son's precious name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to try to walk you through Isaiah 53 briefly, only giving you an overview. And I hope, I pray that I can in some small way convey to you the weight of this chapter. This chapter, I definitely believe, if you are a Christian, I would almost suggest you commit this whole chapter to memory. It is an amazing chapter. It is the very foundations that we even have this church comes from this chapter. The very foundations that you can ever say you're a sinner saved by grace comes from this chapter. The very hope that you have of an eternal life comes from from this chapter. Everything about the Christian life and walk comes from this chapter. I read to you 52 verse 13 because it starts out with God talking to Israel through the mouth of Isaiah. God says, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you. He's talking to Israel. People were astonished at Israel because God had so allowed them to be taken into destruction because of their wickedness. People were amazed that they could worship a God who would just allow them to be decimated by foreign armies. He says, just as they were amazed at your appearance, they will be amazed at my servant's appearance. Why does he say that? Because in verse 14 he says, his appearance, his is his servant. So God's servant's appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than any son of man. But he will sprinkle many nations Kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. God says, one day my servant will sprinkle all nations with his sacrifice. People will look upon his marred disfigurement, his piercings. Kings will shut their mouths at his very presence, the very mention of his name, because he says he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Now to a Jew, if you had said then that someone is high, exalted, and lifted up, it meant you were talking about God. So God himself is saying God will be highly exalted and lifted up and God will have an appearance marred more than any man. You have to understand that at this time they did not know of a man named Jesus Christ. We look back and can say, oh, he's talking about Christ. But they did not know that. So they're looking saying, who, who is this man? Who will be this man that is God's servant who will be marred and disfigured and will be spit upon? Who is that guy? Well, as time went on throughout Jewish history, they began to interpret this to mean that God was actually not talking about a man. He was talking about Israel itself as a people. They said, we've suffered so much throughout history. 
People stronger than us have taken us into captivity, have killed us, have done all these things to us. This must be figuratively referring to us as God's people. So then when you read the rest of the prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ's coming, and it talks about him coming as a military ruler and a powerful political figure who will destroy the enemies of Israel, they think that's who's coming. If you go to the New Testament and you read what they thought about Jesus, they did not believe Jesus because Jesus did not come with power or political authority. He came as a humble servant, and they did not understand him. So they thought he was a blasphemer because they misunderstood this chapter right here. Let's look at Isaiah 53. I want to break this down, as I said, and refer to it as Israel confessing here. This is Israel in the future, one day looking back at how they treated Jesus Christ. So in the first thing they do, they confess their own rejection of Jesus Christ. In verse 1 it says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. I'm not going to share with you, I don't have time, all of the New Testament verses. If you've read your New Testament, you will know that the Jews hated Jesus Christ. What did they do to him? They hated him so much, they convinced the Romans to hang him on a cross under the rules of their capital punishment. They thought Jesus was a false teacher, a blasphemer. They thought they were doing God a favor by killing Jesus. So they look back one day in the future under God's kingdom in this prophecy. They're looking back and now they're confessing how wrong they were to have rejected God's servant. Notice verse 1. They lament by saying, no one has believed our message. They said, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It doesn't necessarily mean here that they were speaking a message. What this means is that God gave Israel a message. He gave them prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of the Messiah to come, and they never believed it. He gave them the Messiah in person, and they did not believe him. They're looking back and weeping over this, saying, we did not believe the message God gave us. And they said, we saw the arm of the Lord, his power revealed to us in Jesus Christ, and we did not believe him. We did not believe that. And they're weeping over this. They're mourning because of their rejection of Christ. Now they say in verse 2, well, why did we reject Christ? What was wrong with him? Well, basically it comes down to his origins and how, what kind of a man he was. They say, verse 2, he grew up before God like a tender shoot. That's basically referring to um, like an infant child who's growing up and nursing. And they say, well, Jesus, he came born of a woman and grew up before the Lord like any other person does. Then he uh, was like a root out of parched ground. They're saying where Jesus came from was not a place of importance, a little town of Bethlehem. Jesus of Nazareth, that's not an important place in Israel. They even say in the New Testament, no prophet ever come out of Nazareth. When Jesus would say where he was from, they said, we can't believe you. No prophet's ever from your area. No one of importance comes from your family. Who are you to say these things? They say, we didn't believe him. We didn't like where he came from. We didn't like that he was no different than anyone else. He was not a powerful figure. Now they go on. He has no stately form or majesty, that we should look upon him. They were looking for a man to come who was very much royalty, powerful, a king, a ruler. And Jesus comes born in a farm, in a barn basically, in a feeding trough, born of a virgin, grows up like anyone else, the son of a carpenter from a place in Israel that no one cares about. And they say this was why we did not believe him at first, because he came in a way that was totally opposite of what we expected they say he had no beauty he had no majesty that we could acknowledge about him they even say that uh, he nor appearance that we should be attracted to him so we weren't attracted to Jesus we didn't want Jesus because he didn't come in king's apparel he didn't come from royal lineage in a way he did but not immediately so we couldn't accept that no savior of mine they say would come the way Jesus came so they rejected him because of where he was from, how he grew up, who he was in family to. Verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Now they lament and say, we refused him to the point that we did not even want to look at him. Our face did not want to look at his face. We did not give him any respect. We did not esteem him as any special person at all. He was despised, forsaken by us. We did not esteem him means they literally did not even acknowledge him. He was a nobody. And remember, they're looking back, confessing this. We rejected Christ, and that was wrong. Well, what am I really getting at? Why am I really talking to you from the Old Testament? What does this really matter? I hope I can try to express to you that what they are experiencing, what they are mourning about, the reason God gave it to us in the Bible for us to read today is so that we can look and not follow the mistakes that they made. Israel would be saying to us today that there are some of us, like the majority of the world, that rejects Christ. The majority of the world hates Christ, whether they say it or not. They reject Christ. They want nothing to do with Christ as Savior. They may acknowledge Him as a good man, as a good teacher, but not as Savior. The majority may go so far as to despise Christ and not want to look at Him like they say that they did. And I want to say this is how true repentance begins. If you truly want to know if you are a child of God, have you ever come to a point where you acknowledge that you have wrongfully rejected Christ at a past time in your life? They did. They said this was wrong. We rejected Christ, our Savior, like the rest of the world does. Some of you here today may have truly repented and acknowledged that you have rejected Christ before. That is how the Christian life starts. We all must acknowledge that we have, before we come to Christ, been rejecting Christ, whether we said it or not. Israel would say to us, do not make our mistake. Do not reject Christ anymore. Do not look upon him as just a good man, as a nobody. Look upon him as a savior, the forgiver of sins. Well, that's their confession there. Their next confession, verse 4. Let me try to move through this quickly. Israel now confesses that Christ's death was for them. Verse 4, surely our griefs, the R here is Israel, remember. So our griefs, he, that's Christ, he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. They're looking back and confessing now. Christ's death was for us, they say. And what are they getting at? They're saying that Christ, and I'm going to use this word here. Let me explain it. Christ vicariously bore their sins. We use that word every now and then. Vicariously means that uh, I can say, well, uh, Brother Morgan, uh, I vicariously uh, work through Brother Morgan. Well, that doesn't mean that I literally go to his job place and that I literally get his paycheck, but it could mean that if Brother Morgan and I come to this agreement that I vicariously work through Brother Morgan at his job, when Brother Morgan is at his job site working, it would be officially looked upon as it is myself working rather than Brother Morgan. They're saying here Jesus Christ bore our sins. Vicariously, Jesus Christ took upon the sins of these people upon himself. It doesn't mean that Christ literally sinned. But it does mean that God looked upon Christ and placed their sins on him, their behalf upon him. So they're admitting this. They're saying when Christ died, he bore our sins, our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried. Yet we, did, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. They're saying that Christ bore their sins, but when they saw Christ on that cross, they looked upon him that God was punishing him, not that he was dying on their behalf. They said, here's this blasphemer. Here's this false prophet. If you remember the New Testament, they even cried out to Jesus, if you really are the Son of God, then save yourself. If you really are God's Son, call these angels down to protect you then. They didn't believe in him that he was bearing their sins. They looked upon him as being punished by God. They said, that's what they say here. He was smitten of God and afflicted. That's how we viewed him, as a sinner. But, verse 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. So while they viewed Jesus being punished by God as a sinner, he was actually carrying their sins on that cross. 
His punishment was for them. They say that he was pierced. The language here in Isaiah is so specific. If you read through this whole chapter and you go to the New Testament, it literally happens the way Isaiah says. They pierce Jesus' side with the staff. They pierce his hands and feet with nails. He was literally pierced, and they say that piercing was for us on our behalf. But we did not view him that way. He was crushed for our sins, our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment that he took was for our well-being. Well-being means peace. They're looking back and saying Christ's punishment that he took on the cross for our place was to give us peace with God. Without that, we would have no peace with God. Let me move on. Verse 6. They say here now then Jesus was punished by God for their own rebellion. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. I hope you're noticing this language. They keep saying he bore our sins, he bore our grief, he carried our transgressions. Uh, The Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Again, Christ never sinned, but God took these sins, these transgressions of these people, and placed them upon him. So when he's dying on the cross, he's dying in their place. When he is paying the penalty for sin, the penalty is being paid for them. But they're now admitting this. And they say he died because we all strayed. We, as God's people, rebelled against God like sheep who go astray. So God took that sin, their sins, and put them upon Christ. And what they're saying here is for us, if you have acknowledged that your rejection of Christ at one point in your life was wrong, you have repented of that, confessed that to God, and you've come to Him for salvation, then take comfort because this says to you, Christ's death on the cross was for you. It was for you personally. If you have come to Christ and He is your Savior, you can say with them, on that cross, He bore my sins. He bore my punishment. It was paid for in full in my place. I hope, Christians, that you understand your sins and my sins crushed Jesus. That's the wording he uses. He was crushed for our iniquities. If he is your Savior, it was your sins and my sins that crushed him. I hope you understand that his punishment that God placed upon him brought you and I peace with God. I hope you understand that you and I have all at one point been as sheep who've gone astray, but through Christ he brought us back to himself. God put our sins on Christ. If you are not one of God's here today, you're not sure, Isaiah would say to you and the rest of Israel, if you go through life having never repented of your sins and come to Christ for salvation and you die in this life, you have no place in verses 4 through 6. Your sins have not been paid for. Your penalty has not been paid. Only those who come to Christ through faith, Isaiah says, have had the death of Christ applied to them. Only those who have Christ as Savior can say, He bore my sins, my iniquities. Israel would say to us today, realize that Christ's death is for sinners like them and us. So do not reject the death of Christ as they did. Verse 7, now Israel makes another confession. They confess that Christ was innocent in his death. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. So they first of all confess, well, Christ was persecuted, yet he was submissive the whole time. How much was he submissive? They say, well, he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like sheep that is silent before its shears. They say Christ was so humble. He was so meek in all of this experience, in all of this death that he bore. The the illustrations they give, they compare the God of heaven and earth to a lamb and a sheep, two of the most lowly, humble animals on the face of the earth. They say he was as silent as a lamb being carried away to its slaughter, did not utter a word of opposition. If you go to the New Testament and read at Jesus' trial, They would ask him all these questions, 
And it says at points that Jesus, he just stood there. Jesus even said to Peter, I could call thousands of angels down to save me. But he didn't do that. He took it. He humbly took it and was silent. He was like a sheep being carried away to have its hair trimmed, did not utter a word. He was also judged and killed as an innocent man. They say in verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was taken away because they judged him as a criminal. They judged him as a sinner. Now the wording here, my translation says, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. It's a little wordy, but what he's trying to say here is when Christ was taken away to be killed and he was punished as an innocent man, he was punished for those who truly deserve the punishment. He says no one of his contemporaries even realized what was going on. There were few who looked upon Christ and admitted that he was dying for sinners. The majority of people looked at him and cursed him and said he is a sinner who deserves what he's getting. Verse 9, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now they say he was punished as a criminal, yet he never committed a crime. He was assigned with wicked men. He was crucified with two thieves, one on his left, one on his right, treated no different than a common criminal deserving death. And they say that's how we treated our Messiah. Yet he was a rich man in his death. The best way I understand this is when they took Christ off the cross, they would have given him a common burial with those thieves. He would have been buried as a criminal. But yet it was Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man, who came along and said, I would like Jesus' body to bury him in my new tomb I just bought. And they are saying, yet he was buried as a rich man. At least one man honored him in his death. They're saying, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was an innocent man dying an innocent death because he had done no wrong in deed or word. For us today, it's easy to trample and spit in Jesus' face. It is easy to trample and spit in Jesus' face because we can forget just how innocent and humble he really was. I know in my life it's so easy to forget that I deserved what he took. And when I do that, it seems as though I lose some of my humility and to sin kind of becomes an easy thing to do. But if I ever want to be more convicted of sin and get really brought down low, I, I read this chapter because it's really me that should have been here. It's really you who should have been here. Being nailed to a piece of wood, being crushed for iniquity and sins. But they're looking back and weeping, saying we did not realize that Christ was doing this for us at that time. The last part here, wrap this up and I want to say something about this. Israel makes a last confession. They confess that Christ is victorious, and they confess that he will be rewarded. Verse 10, they say, The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. I actually really wanted to get through this chapter just to get to verse 10. This is really where all the meat is. I just want to say something about it, and we'll move on, and I'll end this sermon. This is so important. Verse 10 is perhaps one of the most precious verses in all the Bible, yet it is also the most scandalous verse in all the Bible. I have heard church people call preachers heretics for saying to you what I'm about to say about verse 10. It says, but the Lord was pleased. That word in Hebrew means he took pleasure in. He was happy to crush him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. Do we ever think about that? Did you realize that when Christ was on the cross, that his own father was grinding him to bits? And it says, it pleased him. Did you realize that? Because you see, we have a banner here of Jesus hanging on a cross. And I've, I heard a Christian at another place ask me one time, 
They said, you know, I, I believe the gospel, but I don't understand why what he went through on a wooden cross gets me my salvation. And I said, you don't understand. It was not the physical punishment of the cross that was bad. Yes, that was bad. Being nailed to a piece of wood, being hung there to be spit upon, to be cursed at. He was beaten in the face at his trial. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails over and over his flesh being pulled from his back. But all of that, having to carry his heavy cross up the, his own wood that he's going to be killed on, carried it himself up a hill. All of that was common everyday capital punishment. That was how the Romans killed people who were criminals. The beauty and the scandal of the cross is not the wood. It's not the nails. It's not what he went through before he's on the cross. It's this right here in verse 10. The Lord was pleased to crush him. On that cross, as Jesus is hanging there, the pain that he feels, the real pain that he goes through is his own father ground him to bits with his own wrath. Because on that cross, he satisfied the wrath of God for your sins and my sins. That's what I said earlier that that pastor said, God is good and I'm not and you're not. What does a good God do with bad people? A good God sends bad people to hell. God must satisfy his own holy justice, his own Holiness must be satisfied. And God said in Exodus, I cannot let the guilty go unpunished. Every one of us in this room are guilty sinners. Every one of these Israelites are guilty sinners. Everyone. God can't leave us go unpunished. God can't leave an Israelite go unpunished. How does he get away with this? Because here in verse 10, on that cross as he's hanging there, God was satisfying his own justice. God was satisfying his own wrath against sin on his own Son, you who are parents would never think of unjustly punishing your children, would you? You don't take delight if you have to spank your child or ground your child, but you do it for their own good. Yet this man never did anything wrong, and yet he was punished by his own father. He was crushed, the word is, ground up from his own father. Why would he do that? That was the only way that God could save a sinner like me. Because I could never live a good enough life before God to get into his presence. And God cannot just openly allow sinners into his presence or else he would no longer be a holy God. He must judge sin. So he took the only perfect man, his own son, God in the flesh, had him come on earth at a time period where the common form of execution was to be nailed on a cross on public display. But on that cross, that is when God took the sins of these people and my sins and your sins, placed them upon him and said, I will satisfy my justice against sin on my own son. That's the scandal of the gospel, is that the holy God Father crushed his own holy son to pay for my salvation and to pay for yours. That's how bad of sinful people we are. That it took this. It took God the Father to crush his own son. Nothing less would do. Again, it pleased the Lord to crush him, putting him to grief. Why would God do this? It goes on, because if Christ would submit himself to this, if he would subject himself to this punishment from God, even though he was innocent, then God would reward him. He would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. If you are a child of God, you are one of Christ's offspring. You are his reward. I am his reward for doing this. He sees his offspring. He also says he would prolong his days. He reigns eternal at the right hand of the Father. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God took the work of Christ and said, If you will do this, Jesus... You subject yourself to that pain and that punishment. You subject yourself to my own wrath. I will prosper your work. And those of us in this room today who call him Savior are a part of this prospering of his good work. We are his offspring. We will be with him for all eternity. This is Christ's reward. You and I. 
He says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Him going through this anguish, this is his reward. To have children, to have brothers and sisters that he can enjoy for all eternity with God the Father. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, that's talking about Christ, he will justify the many. That means make right with God the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Verse 12 says, God the Father says to God the Son, I will reward him in all eternity. He will have a portion with the great and with the strong. We are the great and the strong, because those of us who are in Christ inherit with Christ. He says we are joint heirs with Christ. We are his inheritance. We will share in the glories of eternity with Christ. We will be with him forever and ever, never to sin anymore, never to be snatched away from his hand. In closing, I just, I've not done enough. That's not even 5% of this chapter. There could be a sermon done on every verse. I could never say enough. But I just want to say, if you go through here and you're a Christian, let me talk to you Christians. I hope you understand what actually happened on the cross. It's not just that he was killed, he was nailed. Yes, that's horrible. But it was that his own father satisfied his own wrath on him because of how sinful we are. And if you go through this chapter, notice the wording. It says, he bore our griefs. He carried our iniquities. He literally carried my sins on his body on that cross. He bore them. He carried them. God punished him because of me. If you're here and you're not a Christian or you're not sure, don't commit the sin that Israel did. They rejected Christ. They didn't understand Christ. They didn't think his death meant anything. Don't do what they did, they would say to you today, and they will say in the future. They would say to you, confess Christ as Savior and Lord. Come to him as the only Savior for your sins, because without this, without him hanging there, paying the penalty for sin, there is salvation in no other. I hope in some way then you have maybe, by God's grace, understood something from this chapter. I I know I am barely a mediocre preacher, but I love this chapter. I love the truth it conveys because it says to me that when you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and we get so hung up on the love of God, and that's true, God is love. But you can't understand how much God loves you until you understand how much he hates your sin because he, he hates your sin so much, he crushed his own son because of it, because he loves you so he could save you. That's John three sixteen. I hope you realize that. I hope you realize how wicked we are without Christ, that it took God to crush his own son to even give us salvation. I hope you realize how much God loves you, that he would go so far as to crush his only son for you and me. And yet we dare live sometimes the way we live, not thinking about what we do, not thinking about the will of God, not thinking about the sins we commit, I believe this should drive us to be holy, to understand Isaiah 53, just how much the Father loves us. But I want you, if you're a Christian, to take courage and rejoice because you will one day reign with Christ. What he went through here purchased mine and your salvation for all eternity. You are his inheritance that God rewards him with. I'd like to ask, not so much invitation, but could we have the hymnal, Oh, What a Savior, in closing again? I love that hymn. Uh, Sing that hymn and understand something more from Isaiah 53 about what kind of a Savior that you're actually singing to and serve.
Let's all stand.